Hi guys, welcome back. Sorry it's been a while. I've been keeping myself quite busy. We're not quite moved in just yet, just waiting for a few little things like lights to arrive, but we should be moving in soon. In this video, what I'll do is talk about how we've done the walls, including the insulation, the drywall, and also the plastering. These style of houses quite rightly have a reputation for being cold. This house was not built to be well insulated. It was built to allow the air to flow through the house and for it to breathe. That's because Japanese have traditionally been more concerned about the heat and humidity of summer rather than the cold of winter. Just to give you a bit of context, the temperature in summer here where we live averages around 33 degrees Celsius. In winter, lowest temperatures are usually just above zero. We get snow about once or twice a winter. I did a quick model of the structure of the walls in SketchUp for you guys. It's relatively accurate, but not exactly to scale. I didn't go into the house to work out how the floor was attached. Inside there is a sheet of gypsum board over which there is a layer of mortar and then the green sand based finish. Outside there are fiberglass bats with metal cladding. The posts are just under 12 centimeters or 4 and 5 eighths inches thick. I guess the difference between this house and modern homes is that the interior wall is attached between the posts rather than over them. So we wanted to at least reduce the air gaps in the walls, especially between the posts and interior wall and the cold transferring through the posts to the inside. Our architect recommended us to put foam boards over the existing walls and posts to help air seal and insulate. We used a product called Neoma Foam, which is a brand of phenolic foam non-combustible insulation panel. I'm not sure how it compares to the foam boards available overseas, but it's considered one of the better options in Japan. The 25mm or 1 inch thick panels that we have mainly used have an R value of 1.25 or 7.1 in inch pounds. I'm not a great multitasker and measuring and cutting the foam accurately, especially to fit around the beams, quite a good deal of concentration and moving a camera around and pressing record was just one step too far for my limited brain. It was a formidable task but I got it done in the end. Over the foam we installed a vapour barrier as per the manufacturer's recommendation. Of course the floors and ceilings are perhaps even more important than the walls. On the floors we used foam boards below a 3cm solid wood Japanese cedar floor. If you're wondering why we didn't use Neoma foam there too, good question, I don't know. The ceiling is insulated using fiberglass bats. Once the foam was done, the carpenters and I hung gypsum boards. For those wondering, the standard sheet size for foam and gypsum board is 1820mm by 910mm, which closely approximates the traditional post spacing in Japanese architecture. Also, drywall is typically hung vertically in Japan, with screws spaced 15cm apart, including the center line, to increase their strength versus earthquakes. I'm not sure if they do this in other earthquake prone countries, I'd be curious to know. We needed to hang the drywall through the 25mm foam onto the studs and as I couldn't find any regular drywall screws long enough to hang the boards with, I used 65 and 70mm galvanized steel screws. Hanging drywall was quite a bit of a challenge with all of the beams and posts. In fact, for some of the higher sections, it was practically impossible to fit larger sheets in. So I had to cut and put up smaller pieces like a jigsaw puzzle.
It was also a major hassle doing the boards up there, especially when you didn't measure or cut them to the correct size. Now the effectiveness of this insulation will be greatly reduced if the windows are single pane. So all new windows are double glazed windows, but we have left a lot of the originals in place, mainly for budget reasons, but we'll likely replace these down the track. We will be using shoji, that's the paper screens, as they're just thin paper. They obviously won't provide much in the way of insulation, but hopefully they'll keep the draft down. For our main source of heating, at least initially, we plan to use a wood-burning stove complemented by space heaters. I know a lot of people have suggested heated floors, which would have been nice, but my wife was not so keen on them. Now that we've sealed a lot of the walls, apart from opening windows or using air conditioners, one measure to reduce the effect of humidity in the house is using a traditional material that is not used so much today in Japanese houses, and that is a lime plaster called shikui. If you've visited Japan or seen Japanese castles and houses in pictures, you may have noticed a lot of white walls. These walls are typically covered in shikui. Shikui is made by mixing slaked lime with other organic materials and water. Traditionally white in colour, pigments can be added for a wider variety of colours these days. We decided to stick with the white. I know it's a popular combination, but I just thought it looked best with all of the woods that are being used in the house, and it would also make the house a bit brighter. Lime plaster absorbs carbon dioxide and hardens over time. It's strong against humidity as it absorbs moisture and releases it when the air is less humid. It's anti-odour and as lime is alkaline, it is also mould resistant. Shikui is normally applied by professional plasterers and is considered quite expensive as it can be difficult to apply due to a long drying time of over 24 hours per coat, which also makes it difficult to achieve a smooth finish. According to our carpenter, up until about 50 years ago, shikui was commonly used in homes but cheaper and easier to apply sunakabe, sand-based plaster, that also came in a wider variety of colours than shikui, became popular. The original green walls in our home are sunakabe. I started off on smaller walls and the toilets before working up to the larger walls. These dormer walls I did early on, but I didn't do a great job. You can see the bump where the tape on the seams is. It's a very disappointing wall. By the way, that's a sentence I never imagined I'd say a year ago. Do you have any disappointing walls in your house? I've improved a bit since then, so I may redo these walls at some point. So, since shikui is not such a common way of finishing interior walls these days, there are not many tradesmen skilled in applying shikui anymore, so it can be quite expensive. For example, to do all of the walls that we're doing in our house would cost around 1.3 million yen or $13,000. I'm using a premixed DIY shikui, just because I thought it would be less hassle and easier to use as a novice. It contains about 1% acrylic to make it bind more easily and dry more quickly. But the downside is that it's quite expensive compared to using powdered shikui and mixing it with water, which is what a pro would use. 
For example, a large 18 litre tub costs around $120 for an amount that covers 28 square meters. Whereas the powdered shikui is about seven times cheaper. So far I've used about six buckets. Before applying the shikui to the upper walls, I needed to clean and paint the beams. I'm using one coat of Osmo wood wax finish and I'm very happy with the results. I didn't bother sanding the wood as it was very dry and hadn't been treated before. The oil absorbed in well while leaving a nice wax finish afterwards. By the way, no, I haven't put on a lot of weight. I'm doing this in the middle of summer and it's really hot on the upper levels of the house so I got myself a fan jacket that blows air up under the vest. It works really well. You're supposed to apply two thin coats of shikui. You apply the second coat around one and a half to two hours after the first coat, after it's dried slightly, but before it hardens too much. This actually makes it pretty tricky to do big spaces, which we have a lot of, as you need to move quickly to do a full side in one go, which is recommended. Also, I'd recommend not doing the DIY shikui in summer, like I did, as it dries even more quickly. By the way, I hope you like power ballads as much as I do. Like every 
So I'm pretty happy with the results. Of course it does look better from far than close up as there are some scratch marks from dried plaster that were stuck on the trowel which I didn't do a good enough job of cleaning off. It's also not completely flat so when the light is in a certain direction you can see shadows. However I think if I had the time maybe practicing and getting good at using the powdered shikui that might have been a better option. Has anyone tried the real shikui? Uh, what are your thoughts? Okay, so I haven't finished yet. I'm probably going to finish it once we move in, which should be very soon, hopefully. For the external cladding, we decided to use sugi, a Japanese cedar, rather than using the metal siding like was on the house originally, as we had initially intended. The plan was to use the same black material that we used on the dormers, I wasn't such a fan of that colour and was also not sure about having too much black on the house, especially a different shade of black to the original upper material. We couldn't decide what colour to use as an alternative. Something about dark brown didn't really do it for me. The original tan colour grew on me and it's still available but also looks a bit dated. So in the end we settled on natural wood. Since this house was built over 30 years ago, houses in Japan are now required to have a weather barrier under the siding. Here we are using a Tyvek sheet that allows moisture out but prevents it from getting in. I decided to paint it using the Osmo Clear UV protection oil to match the upper beams as much as possible, but I can always change the colour later if so desired as it's pretty easy to paint. Although it would have been nice to have used the same lattice siding on the front of the house as on the side of the genkan, it's more difficult to make as the vertical wood needs to be chiseled to fit the horizontal planks. And you may have noticed that there are no nails visible as it's fastened from the inside. So it would have needed to have been a decision made a lot earlier, that is before hanging the internal walls. The carpenter suggested a much easier and cheaper way to create the look. For example, here on the bathhouse wall, the planks are fastened horizontally with the vertical strut nailed over the top without chiseling. It can be done in a day but obviously not quite as nice as the traditional way of doing it. But going back to the front of the house we liked the vertical boards as it kept the same style as the previous cladding and ended up cheaper than getting new galvanized siding. I think it looks nicer too. You might be wondering what that strange section joining the main house to the bathhouse is. Well, the ceiling on the previous passageway was very low, so we needed to raise it. The carpenter recommended we raise it high enough that it would angle down over the edge of the bathhouse roof to reduce the amount of rainwater getting between the main house and the bathhouse. It made sense from a practical level, though it does look a little bit weird in my opinion, but I'm used to it now. All right, thanks guys for watching. Um, the lights have actually just arrived, uh, we've got internet, so once we get the lights installed hopefully we can move in very very shortly. I'll update you when I have um, a moment. Thanks, bye!